Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for Ecolabs webinar series. Uh, my name is Tas, and I'm an innovation manager at Ecolabs Center of Innovation for Energy, or Ecolabs for short. Uh, I'll be hosting this session today. Uh, Ecolabs is a national center of innovation uh, for clean energy and sustainability, uh, jointly established by Enterprise Singapore, Sustainable Energy Association of Singapore, and uh, Nanyang Technological University. Uh, we create programs that help uh, startups and SMEs to pilot, testbed, and commercialize their deep tech solutions. We also work with the corporate partners and helping them to adopt complex and novel technologies and reach their sustainability objectives. Uh, we also work with investors uh, and helping them to build strategies and make uh, sensible investments in the clean energy sector. What makes us unique is our industry insights and access to the world's leading researchers uh, in sustainability, clean energy experts, testbeds, and pilots. We're organizing the ECLAPS webinar series to enhance the engagement and interaction with our partners, uh, where we invite industry and market experts to offer their insights. At the end of the session, we'll have 10 minutes for the Q&A and a quick uh, pop-up poll where you can indicate your interest in connecting with speakers. Today's webinar titled uh, China's Energy Storage Market, uh, Trends and Opportunities. And it is a part of uh, a partnership between Eclabs and uh, Larson and Sweden, or LVS for short. LVS specializes in uh, funding and executing international expansion of uh, innovative cross-stage companies. They make active expansion investments to establish footholds uh, for its portfolio companies outside their home markets. LVS hands-on management of the entire expansion enables companies to move faster and securely to the new regions. LVS focuses on the following fast growing sectors, uh, more specifically healthcare and biotech, industry 4.0 and new energy, and media and entertainment. Uh, let me give a, also a quick introduction of the speakers. Uh, we have Nick Larson, who is a managing partner at LVS. Nick is a Danish uh, national and has been working and living in China since 2013. His professional experience encompasses insurance, boutique investment, bulge uh, bracket investment, banking, Chinese multifamily office and private equity. Before founding LVS Partners, Nick was a partner at Mandarin Hill Capital, as well as IGK Capital, where he led the China expansion for multiple portfolio companies in solar, healthcare, IoT, media, and entertainment. Nick also sits on various China advisory boards for expansion and growth companies. We also have Yazad Setna today, uh, head of strategy at LVS. Yazad is a British national who joined LVS Partners in 2019. As a head of strategy at LVS, uh, Yazad worked on investment target selection, due diligence, market entry strategy, and execution across the healthcare, industrial, and the entertainment sectors. Prior to joining LVS, Yazad worked at uh, private equity firms, IJK Capital and Mandarin Hill Capital, where he contributed to the investment and management of international companies expanding into China. Thank you, Nick and Yazad, for joining us today. And the flo floor is yours. Hi, thank you for the introduction, Stash. I'll just share my screen and we can get started. Um, can you see my screen all well, all good? Yep, all is good. All is good, great. Thank you for the introduction, Stas. So today's webinar talk is going to be on China's um, energy storage market, where we're going to take a look at the trends and opportunities. This webinar is looking to introduce the key data points and approach to start to understand the Chinese energy storage market. So let's begin. So firstly, why would China? Why would China? Why does China need energy storage systems? Well, firstly, energy storage is defined as the conversion of electrical energy from a power network into a form which can be stored until converted back to electrical energy. And the overarching goal of energy storage systems is to, systems is to make electricity grids more efficient, resilient, cost effective and to expand the electricity market services. China is a vast energy infrastructure. And it's constantly looking to continue to grow and update, it, update this. And given the range of um, energy storage uh, solutions, an energy storage system can offer to a grid, uh, China will be looking to um, deploy energy storage as a way to uh, enhance its grid's efficiency, resiliency, and, uh, and to continually improve it. Secondly, energy storage systems is a crucial tool for enabling the efficient, effective integration of renewable energy. 
as with all countries, and as I think we're all aware, um, countries are moving away from fossil fuel based power generation, but that means they have to increasingly incorporate renewable based power generations into their grid. A common issue with renewable power generation is that it's variable outputs, but coupling it to an energy storage solution seems to be one of the best ways to uh, integrate it effectively into the grid. Thirdly, energy storage systems play a vital role in China's transition from a centralized generation and control power system to a distributed generation and control power system. Historically, like with many markets and industry in China, it's, um, uh, it's been managed in a very intense top-down manner. But however, um, a very centralized grid is susceptible to outages and very inflexible to growth in servicing areas. So distributing the grid is something that will mix it more advanced going forward and energy storage systems can play a crucial role in that. From a more policy perspective, renewable energy plus energy storage is a primary technology pathway to achieve the 2030 carbon peak and 2060 carbon neutral goals. As, um, as I mentioned, the second point, energy storage systems are key for incorporating renewable energy into the power grid. So quickly, uh, before we get into the details of China, it's good to get an overview of the key applications of energy storage systems, particularly their stationary applications. And the primary market, um, primary uh, stationary energy market segments are utility scale. And this refers to systems installed on transmission or distribution networks, which provide services to grid operators. Then we have behind the meter applications, which are systems installed on the customer user side of the utility meter. And they primarily help reduce the cost and improve the resili resilience for commercial industrial enterprises or industrial uh, or residential developments. And finally, we have remote power systems. This refers to energy storage systems that operate as part of an isolated electricity network. Overall, um, energy storage systems are being implemented to meet a variety of different needs across the whole spectrum of the grid. And the locations where they can be deployed are spread out across these three key market segments and can meet a variety of different needs. And that's what's depicted by this figure we have here. You see there's three, the three key stakeholders that will be using energy storage systems include uh, utility services, which are used um, uh, on the grid generation and transmission side where they can be deployed for a variety of functions such as resource adequacy where energy storage can collect energy and deploy it when the grid is stretched or under high demand. And then on this side we have uh, regional transmission organizations or grid operators can deploy energy storage for energy arbitrage um, but particularly with respect to renewables, it can help regulate their frequency and voltage support. It also has functions in black start, which is where um, a grid can um, restart from an outage without requiring the external need of, a, of another energy grid system because the energy storage system is locally there. And then here on the customer side, on the behind the meter type applications, we have um, uh, use cases such as demand charge reduction, time of use management, where it's cheaper for um, a large industrial enterprise to install an energy storage system that can collect electricity when it's cheaper and then deploy it during peak hours and not required to pay expensive rates from the grid. So the overall point of this slide here is just to introduce the vast, vast range of applications that energy storage systems can provide to the grid across a whole range of stakeholders, from the big power generators all the way through to people, operate, people and small companies operating in remote power systems. So, as I said earlier, this point of the webinar is to start to introduce the key data points and approach to start to understand the Chinese energy storage market. And the key way to do that, I believe, is to break it down to these four key sections. So as we saw just then, the key role of energy storage systems is to make the grids more resilient and effective. So the first thing to understand is the macro energy landscape and electrical grid infrastructure and to what extent it may need energy storage solutions. Secondly, we've got China's energy storage market. We'll dive into the specifics in terms of composition because there's a variety of energy storage technologies out there. And then uh, after that, we'll take a closer look at two key two key use cases for, renew for energy storage systems, which is renewables and electric vehicle charging. And finally, with any market that you wanna to look to in China, it's so important to understand the policy because of the top-down uh, centralized control uh, policymakers, uh, power policymakers have over markets where they can really set the trajectories through their mandates, incentives, and policy schemes. So firstly, the macro energy landscape in China. So, 
um, the first thing to know about, so first thing to understand is that a country's energy storage potential is fundamentally based on the combination of its energy generation mix, its electric, electricity market structure, its population demographics, its energy demand patterns, and its general grid architecture and structure. So the first thing to consider with China is that it is, it is vast and large. I know that's self-explanatory and most people know it, but let's put some numbers to it. Excuse me. China is the largest power producer in the world. Uh, generating 7,500 terawatt hours. Comparatively, another large economy like the US is only producing 4,000 terawatt hours. Just to put it in perspective this year, the fundamental size of the energy generation. And with an energy generation market of this size, generating consuming that much, it makes China one of the most important energy storage markets in the world. The scale of the infrastructure uh, is something that constantly needs to be updated and improved. And this is um, given the use cases of uh, energy storage to improve the grid there's lots of potential there as mentioned earlier and something we'll dive into deeper later the penetration of renewables <coughs> excuse me in the energy generation mix of a given country is really important to understand too because energy storage uh, solutions are, are a key way to help integrate renewable variable renewable energy output into the grid and as we can see on the graph on the left here um China is adding significant capacity every year, year on year, um, more so than its um, uh, other large economies such as the US or EU. Next, um, we have this graph here, which shows the power difference by province. And this is an important graph to start to understand um, how, uh, understand the interplay between China's energy generation, um, generation demographics and, its, and the interplay with that with its population demographics. Um, and this is important because um, understanding the makeup and nature of uh, each province is important, will um, uh, determine what type of energy storage solutions they'll need. So for example, in up, so what we generally see is the clear trend is that what we see is that um, countries along the um, Eastern coast where they're highly populated and densely populated are energy um, consumer uh, produce and have a power difference that's negative because they consume way more than produce which requires the large power producing surplus surplus provinces to send their power in centrally and that's one of the fundamentals fundamental that's one of the fundamental setup of china's grid, grid infrastructure and this uh, highlights one of the first key points about understanding china in a broader sense and um, specifically how we're going to apply that to energy storage systems and, and entering china is that china is not a monolith it varies from province to province, and the, and, the potent, and the provincial differences in the energy landscape create different opportunities for energy storage solutions. So this slide here just builds on um, the point of the previous slide. So uh, the energy storage system's potential in a given country is heavily influenced by the physical infrastructure, population demographics, and general grid structure. If we take ourselves back to the first, to the second slide, which showed, <coughs> excuse me, we take ourselves back to the um, second slide of this presentation where we showed the variety of use cases for energy storage solutions. We, we can see how a lot of them are based on making the grid more robust and resilient through a variety of ways and functions. And what this um, uh, slide here just puts a bit more color to is again, the point made in the previous one about how there's a high concentration of generation each province will vary in its concentration of generation, transmission and consumption. So along here we have high generation pockets in the green and then in the middle it's mostly consumed by transmission infrastructure and then closer to the provinces where the large cities are based there's less generation but there's far but this is where the majority of the consumption is to be found. And the point is that based on the concentration of power generation, power transmission and power consumption in a given province this will change very much um, the uh, energy storage applications required because energy storage can be used on the generation side as bulk storage. Energy storage can be used on the transmission side to uh, manage uh, frequency regulation and voltage regulation or black star applications. And energy storage can be used on the um, consumption side and transmission and deferral, for example. And also this, um, this slide also highlights how this vast infrastructure is something that China is heavily investing in maintaining and updating. And given energy storage solutions provide um, uh, ensure systems provide solutions to grid operators uh, to improve their grid, um, uh, China is a very large market given the size of it, which needs to be constantly improved. 
And again, um, further building on this point, um, it's really the overall stability of the electrical grid is a really important consideration in determining the potential for the um, stationary energy storage system market for a given country. It's really important to understand the stability of it and reliability of it. So the graph you have here along the top shows the average outage and interruption rate uh, for different prop for different regions and then the uh, national averages here. So the national average is around 14 hours. <coughs> this data is from 2019. Well, I was looked up yesterday just to double check. In fact, in 2021 is the worst year for outages of reliability in China for the past uh, 10 years. So this problem is still persisting quite heavily. And this, what this means is that um, when the demand for China to modernize and update their grid will create opportunities for energy storage solution providers uh, because um, China does suffer from issues of reliability. And again, this is something that varies heavily provincially. In the east, it's much lower than in other areas such as the northwest. So again, if you're an energy uh, storage provider, you ought to think about given for my for my given application, what is the best part or region of China I can go address? Am I there to support grids as a result of reliability issues? Great. Then what part of China would need that the most? And it's also good to know that the reason for the outage is variable, uh, vary too. For example, natural factors seem to be the leading region, meaning natural disasters seem to be a leading reason for it too. So again, that's another important consideration because some provinces will have, be more susceptible to natural disaster than others. And then finally, this is also to the point of how China is moving away from a centralized generation and control power system to a more distributed generation and control power system. And this is because a distributed generation of power control system is far more flexible and tolerant to outages because if a central hub gets knocked out, downstream of that doesn't wipe out large pockets of consumers. Whereas if a distributed one gets knocked out or has an outage issue, it's only localized to a small area. So that's another way to improve the resiliency and also resilience of the, resilience of the grid. And energy, storage, energy storage solutions have great applications on um, in distributed networks. Right, onto the specifics. Now we've taken a look at the um, general macro landscape and the framing of China's um, electrical grid industry and where ESS fundamentally sits on that. We can look into the specifics, but specifics a bit further. So firstly, let's look at China's energy storage market. And the um, broken down by the key um, market segments earlier, it looks like, which is not uh, power generation, Power generation applications, excuse me. For the lead um, energy storage applications, because they tend to be on a very low utilitable energy deployment. As I mentioned earlier, I can put, to put a bit more of this, That's namely wind and solar light resources will fluctuate heavily throughout the day. And what can happen as a common issue is that if, for example, um, the wind or solar energy generation is very low during a time of very high demand from the grid because people are busy using, people are busy uh, causing high energy demand, you'll have a serious deficit, which will obviously make the grid unstable in terms of its power supply. So one way to mitigate that is to have an energy storage solution coupled to the renewables, which will collect the energy. Um, during down during high generation times by the renewables and then be able to manage the high load of demand if that comes later. If the renewable energy resource isn't producing much at that point in time. So that'll be one of the key drivers utility scale energy store. Utility so at the Scale, drive, modernize, and grid. The residual grid will also be a key um, use case for energy storage. Two gigawatts, excuse me, to come up to four, but that can expect to rise to closer to eight gigawatts every year and onwards by 2025. Next, we have um, behind the meter applications, uh, which are mainly driven by backup power, um, applicant backup power, energy backup power use cases. Um, and 
um, energy storage systems will be utilised in homes and businesses to improve the resilience of their power supplies and to help mitigate against power outages. Again, this is forecasted for consistent increase year on year uh, going forward. And finally, we have behind the meat applications, excuse me, we have um, remote power system applications, which is a much smaller market segment, but this will tend to be used for remote grids and um, very far isolated areas that are heavily dependent on quite expensive diesel generators. You would expect to find um, an energy storage system plus a renew small renewable power generation source coupled together might actually be a more cost effective um, alternative given prices for both of those both of these, um, both of those are reducing. So next on to looking at the energy storage market composition. According to the statistics from the China National Energy Alliance, uh, by the end of 2019, the total energy storage capacity in China reached 33 gigawatts, which accounts for 18% of the total global capacity. This shows that China holds a tremendous amount of the global energy storage market uh, and that market. So let's take a closer look the pie chart here on the left. So this is also a good place to start being introduced to the variety of energy storage um, uh, technologies that are out there. So we have electrochemical, which is probably what more most of you are familiar with, which constitutes constitutes lithium ion batteries, flow batteries, lead, lead acid batteries. But there's other technologies such as pumped hydro, molten salt, compressed uh, air energy storage systems too. And one of the key points to highlight um, at this point now is that there that from our experience from looking at when you look at the technologies despite what this graph despite what this pie chart initially shows is that there's no consensus on which energy storage solution is better but rather which um, energy storage system is best for what application because all these energy storage um, technologies here will have different intrinsic properties that make them optimal for a given use case so what we can see right now currently is that China has a huge proportion of currently is pumped hydro and then followed closely by electrochemical but in a very small sense so it's highly dominated by pump hydro but let's address that the reason why this is the case is because historically because energy storage systems is quite a new technology and only just beginning to be implemented in the, into the grid and when um energy storage solutions were deployed in the past historically they were only ever done on a very large scale by the large state-owned enterprises in china which just favored um, really large scale bulk power, uh, bulk storage solutions where pumped hydro is optimal. Plus, um, China has a long history of developing hydroelectric hydro projects to this effect. But let's take a closer look at energy, uh, at the electrochemical segment of um, the energy storage market in China and how that's broken down. <coughs> so, it's highly based on lithium ion batteries, which isn't probably a surprise, followed by lead, lead ion batteries. And then flow batteries, which is a more of a um, experimental phase. So it's key, important to know to the further point as the market goes forward, would expect lithium ion to make electrochemical to make up a large, much larger portion of this graph because it's becoming increasingly technologically viable uh, and more affordable to deploy. And also, um, for example, pumped hydro is very limited by the fact it can't be deployed in flat regions. So this is um so pumped hydro is quite a strong limitation. So we can expect in smaller applications like, for example, behind the meter, uh, to be dominated by electrochemical solutions, as well as um in flatter regions, um uh, in China. So again, you don't understand the geographic nature of China for your energy storage deployment. Um, electrochemical will take a much larger role there, and I think what this slide. The picture this slide paints overall is that how germinating the electrochemical industry is. In the, the, the majority is only pumped hydro because this is something only ever developed by large state owned enterprises. But now we're at the point where electrochemicals become more feasible. It's starting to be implemented and growing, as we'll see in the following slides. So here's the breakdown of the electrochemical energy storage market in China. So China's electrical energy storage market is entering a period of adjusted growth after experiencing massive growth in 2018 at 122% growth, which has come down a little bit to about 71% in, tw in 2019. The, um, the market saw a return to less rapid development in 2019 because one of the key reasons that has recently but is changing uh, has, has historically inhibited um, 
energy storage deployments is the profitability of deploying them and that there's no clear market mechanism to get money back for the people who uh, install them, for the people who uh, pay for an uh, energy storage system from the grid yet. And also there have been some techno technological innovations which have made, which are increasingly making uh, lithium ion batch um, electrochemical energy storage solutions much cheaper. And also the market, it was, has been, the electrochemical market in China has been waiting for strong policy, policy, policy support, which we have now seen, which we'll get into later slides. So if we go to the graph here and just look, uh, at what the figures tell us. So again, it's a very early, so in only, in only in the last few years, it's had very small deployments, the electrochemical energy storage market, but it's set for rapid growth based on two, based on two scenarios. The only thing that really distinguishes the calculation in the conservative and ideal scenarios is the extent of policy support. So we can, given, given the extent of policy support and um, indirect policy support, they'll determine how much of, how much these two will, will uh, we'll find the end where we'll arrive in terms of um, the final amount of electrochemical energy storage deployment by 2024 but it looks like anywhere between 15 gigawatts and 24 gigawatt hours in um, operational capacity by 2024 from where we are now which is um around about uh three to four gigawatts so massive very quick rapid growth set to come um, the, electro, the uh, electrochemical energy market is still germinating and as prices fall and technological advancements continue, uh, the feasibility to install electrochemical energy storage solutions will increase. So now on to looking at the energy storage within the grid. As you mentioned earlier, operators of unstable grids are likely to deploy energy storage solutions to minimise the likelihood of outages that affect large numbers of their customers. This can be seen in the deployment of ancillary services, for example, here, and grid side deployment, just deployments here, which take up quite a large portion too. <coughs> in addition to the factors of stability, the grid in China is in parts aging and overloaded. And when the infrastructure like this is stretched, uh, it may be actually cheaper alternative to implement an energy storage solution rather than go through a really expensive upgrading, um, upgrading costs or really expensive costs to further build out the infrastructure to service new areas or manage peak demand in certain points in the coming years. So it's interesting to see how energy storage is being deployed within the grid. And also, as mentioned earlier, that one of the key use cases of being able to support renewables uh, connection to the grid and uh, generate a stable power supply from them, from renewables. Right, onto, key, onto the key use cases that um, will heavily influence um, to what extent energy storage systems will be taken up by uh, a given market, and that is renewables. Uh, primarily, and then I thought it'd be interesting just to take a look at electric uh, vehicle charging too. So let's get started on this section. So um, one of the key use cases for energy storage systems is to enhance the integration of highly variable outputs as generated by wind and solar power. So in order to understand um, um, to what extent a country will uptake energy storage systems, it's really important to look uh, to what extent they're going to be deploying um, a wind and solar projects in their country. So again, it's first to, first thing to always do when you want to examine a given um, market or facet of China is to see how it breaks down provincially and how much it varies because China is not a monolith. So we have here along the north, the energy resources are highly concentrated in the northern regions and, and northern regions in places such as Hebei, Xinjiang um, and Inner Mongolia. For example, you can see the difference can be quite tremendous. Hebei's got 70 gigawatts of wind power capacity, whereas Zhejiang is only 1.8. This is nearly 10 times less. So problems can have massive difference in their uh, output from renewables. <coughs> so um, what is, uh, so yeah, renewables. So um, also it's important to look at the forecasts of where China is expecting to uh, grow in terms of its wind power capacity. So as of 2020, uh, China had around 20, 281 gigawatts of installed wind capacity. And this is forecast to go to 385 gigawatts by 2025. So this is a trend, tremendous increase and a growth rate that looks to be stable around about 9%. Additionally, as we'll get into a bit later, the 14th five-year plan 
which is one of the key policy um, dictates from the central government, which heavily influences how certain industries uh, go forward in China. Is mandating that new wind developments do incorporate electrical, chemical energy, uh, do incorporate, excuse me, an, a, energy storage solutions. They could be electrochemical or they could be pumped hydro, for example, as you we went through earlier. And given this, so what does this ultimately mean for energy storage solutions? Um, based on the increased uptake of wind power, is forecasted that in order to, um, at some level, successfully integrate this wind power into the grid in a st more stable way, approximately 33 gigawatts of storage energy will be required to be deployed alongside this increase in wind power uh, production for the next, over the next 14 to 5 year plan. And let's move on to the solar power. Again, it's the, it's the same uh, central hypothesis because um, solar is also a variable and renewable uh, energy generation source. It's pretty obvious as there's no, as wind cover and, and snowfall and light can all affect different amounts of solar output as well as not being able to generate at night time. And again, we see the same story of having high variance across different provinces. So it's really important to understand this going forward. And also China is actually looking to develop their wind solar capacity in, even, in an even more exaggerated rate than um, wind power. Because we can see it's going to be growing from 252 gigawatts of installed capacity today to closer to 501 by 2025. So again, a high increase in solar input. Solar generation will need uh, a high amount of energy storage deployments, which is successfully integrated into the grid. And China um, can produce energy, can produce solar panels at quite a, quite a cost effective rate now. And as a price of it keeps dropping, it's only going to become more and more of a mainstay of the power generation, the power generation source in China. Uh, and an interesting trend just to put to you is that um, given subsidies are being phased out for um, solar panels, project developments, um, developers are looking to look for much larger scale projects. Um, to benefit from economies of scale. So large scale energy storage solutions may look like, for, with respect to solar, may look like the um, uh, key, one of the key trends with the specifics to the solar market. And if I didn't mention already, this growth could result in about 42 gigawatts of energy storage required over the next 14 five year plan period. Now, moving on to electric vehicle charging and, and energy demand. This is really interesting. It just shows how um, it just shows how when a key when a large market such as the mobility and vehicle market becomes electrified, uh, how much how much of a challenge this poses poses to the electrical grid, because before this is obviously all dependent on um, fossil fuels and and such. But when a massive market transitions to become electrified, this poses tremendous challenges to the grid. So how, could, how is China going to address that? And as we've also already seen earlier, China's grid is stretched in certain areas um, with, with high consumption, with high, with, that, that over consume more than they produce. China's grid has reliability difficulties. So there's many challenges over the horizon for it and energy storage solutions can provide a key role. But let's put some numbers to the um, electric vehicle charging uh, demand that's expected to come. So it's been forecasted by McKinsey that China's expected to have nearly 75 million electric vehicles by 2030. This is make it the largest EV market in the world. And this will result in um, energy demand increasing from eight terawatt hours to 139 terawatt hours just from the, the, the need to um, charge all these electric vehicles. And uh, as I said earlier, if you think about it, with um, if electric vehicle charging is not say managed in a normal way, you can expect huge peaks where everyone comes home and starts to charge their car at the same time. And if this doesn't match up with high outputs from renewable energy resources, which are expected to become the, one of the mainstays of main parts of the power generation source, you can expect huge spikes in demand for um, energy. And what can be an energy storage solutions can step in and really solve that. Um, a, a use case could be to have um, an energy storage solution that collects that is locally via charging stations that collects energy during off peak times. And it's there to support the grid during peak times and provide energy when many cars are charging at the same time. And to, to this point, um, light passenger vehicles could peak demands by about 41 gigawatts in the evenings, which is a huge amount. 
And what's also interesting is always to take a quick glance at the policy for this. So um, electric vehicle policy policies in China is moving slightly away from electric vehicles and more towards supporting the infrastructure uh, and namely charging uh, infrastructure where energy storage solutions is part of. Uh, moving on to the po China policy implications for energy storage solution and for energy storage systems. So looking at the national policy timeline. In terms of what looking ahead uh, in the market in any market in China, it's always good to have a strong sense of where policymakers are trying to direct and structure the markets because uh, China, even though it is getting more, it, even though it is opening up to more competitive forces, still holds a strong overarching government structure in a very in a very top-down matter manner that can set the trajectory for certain markets. So what we see is that there's key policy phases that will be dictating the overall energy landscape in the, in the coming uh, 40, up until 2060, that have important implications for energy storage solutions. So in phase one, which is where we're in now, we're in the, we're in the beginning years of the, of the 14th five year plan until 2025, we can expect, um, uh, as, manned, as we can expect that renewables will be highly deployed deployed across the grid as we saw in the forecasts earlier but it won't be at the point where, where it reaches grid parity yet and um it won't be one of the mainstays quite yet because it's because china's got tremendously has a tremendous energy energy demand and renewables won't be able to cover the majority of it at this point um energy storage technologies will be doing coverage of around about 50 percent of these um uh, renewable energy generations going forward and now we move on to a really important um policy a really important goal of China's which is to peak carbon emissions by 2030. And what this means is that renewables have to become a humongous portion of the energy generation mix in China. So at this stage there's an increasing demand for energy storage as a result of all these new um, renewable energy deployments and this is the point where we can expect renewables to start to reach grid parity um, uh, and, and make it become affordable. And at this point, we can also expect energy storage deployments to be of a much longer, much, uh, much larger size, covering up to four hours and covering 50 to 100 percent of the generation of the given renewable uh, plant. And next, we and next way looking way ahead in the future in phase three, we have, we have China's goal of being carbon neutral by 2060. This is the point where renewable energy replaces fossil fuels entirely and energy storage. Uh, becomes an absolute key pillar of the grid in order to manage the variable output. And it's at this point we expect energy storage solutions to be incredibly robust and have very long durations for output and have very high coverage of the generations uh, they're storing they're storing energy for. But um, that's quite far in the future, but we can put some specifics give, um, uh, from the current 45 year, five year plan period and look at its implications for energy storage solutions today. So firstly, um, we have uh, institutional reform. Uh, so I, um, so uh, China wants to liberalize the competitive businesses in the energy sector, and it wants to strengthen supervision of natural monopoly businesses too. This is a recent trend in China cracking down on its large monopoly companies. The same has been happening in the energy market to an extent. Um, China's policymakers want to create space for independent power producers and those who want to build good services and solutions. Next, we have non-fossil fuel energy part of the 14th five year plan where, as you've seen earlier, China is striving to significantly increase the utility scale and distributed wind and solar power capacity. We saw the forecast that for earlier. It's gonna be even greater past 2025 too. Um, and then also uh, some specifics, as we saw in the provincial map, uh, they specifically want to develop um, in the regions of the central eastern regions and um, also develop offshore wind power, which is good to know. And again, non-renewable, uh, non-fossil uh, non energy, Renewable energy is a key use case for um, energy storage systems. And then finally, oh, sorry, thirdly, we have new energy where China wants to accelerate the scale up applications of new energy storage technologies and then actively push forward the deployments of EV parking lots and charging poles in urban areas. As you mentioned earlier, this is one that, well, it's a smaller but also very important use case for energy storage where energy storage can come in and support the grid. And finally and fourthly, uh, fourthly and finally, uh, the power grid. Uh, China is accelerating intelligent retrofit for the grids and constructions of smart microgrids. 
and China wants to continuously upgrade and retrofit rural grids and enhance power transmission and distribution in remote areas. Remote areas. If we take ourselves back to the first first few slides and the keys and the um, set and the segment covering China's macro energy landscape, it is vast energy infrastructure. Um, energy storage solutions by provide a key role in supporting the grid and improving all these all these all these um functions here in terms of upgrading it and enhancing the power and transmission distribution of it so yeah so that's it for this slide and next we have um the provincial policy example so again um, it's always important to look at how um, these national overarching goals trickle down and manifest at the level of the province. So I thought it'd be good to put together just a handful of examples to shed some light on this. So in Laoning, um, for example, priority will be given to wind projects uh, that have energy storage facilities to manage um, peak demands. And one of the requirements of this, uh, the projects is that have it has 10% coverage of the overall power of the um, uh, wind project generation plant. Uh, in Inner Mongolia, Again, the uh, one of the ways the policies are mandating, the way, one of the ways the 14th five year plan policies are trickling down is that priority will be given again to solar plus energy storage projects. And here we have in Qinghai, uh, hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm still uh, working on my Chinese. Um, we have uh, the first uh, renewable energy storage subsidy, which is really interesting because um, this is the first time it's ever happened. It was uh, it was uh, announced in March this year. So in Qinghai, for renewable energy storages which sell to the provincial grid, uh, they will receive a subsidy of 0.1 RMB per kilowatt. And also, if any, if also if 60% of manufacturing operations are done in the province too, then 0.5 RMB per kilowatt will be given to. So this is good to see how um, provincial governments are starting to interpret and implement policies to support. Um, energy storage and its relationship to renewable energy generation. And it's really interesting to take a close look at the policy, the subsidy policy, because this is um, <coughs> is addressing one of the common issues uh, in this early phase of energy storage deployment about alleviating the challenge of the high cost of deploying reno of implementing renewables and energy storage solution. Also, it's going to be used to help improve the assessment standards for energy storage systems. Policy as energy storage uh, technologies are quite new to the new to the energy market and the grid, um, policymakers are still learning about how to regulate it and understand it more. Just to understand it more, yeah. So this is uh, overall. This graph just shows uh, this slide just shows how uh, macro policy ambitions trickle down and um, manifest at the level of the provinces. So, in terms of tying up this talk, I wanted to highlight extract the key trends that we've that have emerged from uh, what, I've, what I've laid out in the slides before. So one of the key ideas I always like to emphasize to people and companies when they're looking to approach China is to zoom in from the macro to the micro. China is always, um, has a tremendous allure because of its sheer size and perceived abundance, but it's really important to start to take a closer look of how that actually breaks down in certain pockets and, and niches and what, how that can help best fit your solution. Because at the level of the province, um, China varies in its energy production, its transmission, its consumption and reliability of its grid. All these factors will determine what type of energy storage system will be deployed. It also varies in its wind power and light resources and also varies in how it um, enacts policy and what it focuses on there. So all these factors um, will determine what, how well your potential energy storage system may fit into. Um, a certain part of China, so it's good to zoom in on to zoom in from the macro uh, landscape into the specifics of provinces. For provinces. Um, next, the energy storage market is still germinating. It's still a germinating industry. Um, uh, Interestingly, the beginnings of the um, energy storage system market in China have only ever been large pump hydro operations, um, but we're at the point now where um, electrochemical and other technology breakthroughs are happening, which makes them more feasible and cost effective and more advanced in order to provide a real service to the grid. And also we see it's germinating in the sense that policies are quite new and experimental and looking to learn about how they can best support energy storage system providers in China. So it's all on the cusp, we're on the cusp of it starting to really grow and rocket in China, which leads us to the next point, it leads us to the next point, which is China is a growth market for all the major energy storage um, use cases. 
as I laid out earlier, China can provide, a, excuse me, energy storage systems can provide a, a whole range of services and support to the grid infrastructure. And um, across the key applications and utility scale behind the meter, uh, EV charging, we didn't have time to discuss 5G power stations or data centers where they could be used to all other markets that are set to grow and potentially use energy storage solutions. So as China goes through its next energy transition and grid modernization, energy storage systems will play a key role in that. And finally, uh, another important trend to understand is that China's energy market is freeing up. Uh, overall, the Chinese economy has gradually been opened up to foreign investment and free market forces over the past years. We've seen the large state owned enterprises and grid operators start to cooperate and work with international um, uh, energy um, providers to provide ancillary or supplementary services to their grids so this is a, a really, and also um, we saw in the 14th five year plan is further echoed about making uh, liberalizing the energy market further and managing monopoly powers and on to finally just take a look at this is the final slide and finally just to wrap up further is to understand the opportunities that lie in the china market and so for energy storage providers so what the research and our work in the energy storage market in China to us so far has shown is that <clears throat> for a given country, when you want to evaluate their potential for um, energy storage uh, de uh, deployments, it's broken down across four key areas. So firstly, it's the penetration of renewables. So you want to look at a country's existing energy storage generation mix, and understand to what extent uh, renewables are penetrating. Because as I mentioned multiple times, uh, renewables will be a key driver for the deployment of energy storage systems. And what did we find? Energy storage in China, energy, sorry, excuse me, renewable energy is set for significant growth in China. Secondly, it's important to look at the current makeup and mix of existing energy storage resources, particularly um, operated pumped hydro plants, because they sometimes can limit the need for energy storage solutions. However, despite what we did see is that it does currently own, pumped hydro does hold a large portion of the energy storage market in China, but we do know that it's limited by geographical constraints and also that electrochemical energy storage solutions, or alter alter alternative ones such as electrochemical energy storage solutions will have much greater applications in um, behind the meter uh, and can be used in flatter regions and that pumped hydro is only really ever used for really bulk storage power solutions. And thirdly, um, one of the key ways to determine the demand for um, electro chemical energy storage in a given country is understanding that to what extent uh, the grid is stable and reliable and what we saw in the first part is that China has a vast grid and at certain points it is stretched and has difficulties of stability and reliability again creating opportunities for energy storage providers. Fourth and finally and more so than in any other country, it's always good to look at the extent of the support for government policy of energy storage systems. And what we saw is that there's clear support from the 14th five year plan that have trickled down to provincial policies to start making it a priority um, in their planning and development going forward. And that is all I, and that is the end of the talk. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks a lot, Yazat, for, for such a comprehensive uh, presentation. And now we'll go to, to the last section of today's webinar is the Q&A part, uh, and we'll take around uh, five minutes, after which we'll launch a uh, pop-up uh, poll to ask for all participants if you're interested to, to get connected with the LVS for, uh, for the following discussions. So and now let's get started with the Q&A part. Uh, all participants, you're welcome to uh, type in your questions into the Q&A box or uh, in the chat. So uh, let me start with the first question, Azad. So the first question is, uh, what would be the first steps uh, for a company to enter the China market and what yes. LVS role in it? Nick, um, uh, yeah. Nick, do you want to take, take, these, take some of these questions or should I give it a go? Please give it, please give it a go. Sure, so what will be the first steps? Well. First steps would be um, to the effect of what I've mentioned throughout uh, what I've started doing this presentation, which is a bit of market discovery and really start to understand China's energy storage market overall and then also understand how that changes at the different provincial levels. 
Uh, I think if you're an energy storage system provider, what is always good is to start having discussions with um, leading, um, it, start developing discussions with um, leading potential partners and uh, buyers of your um, solutions and look to set up a pilot project. Pilot projects is always a good way to go because generating um, data in the China markets, generating, um, setting up pilot projects is a good way to demonstrate your technology in the China market, which is really important for bringing on other China Chinese parties going forward. Mm -hmm. And so if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that LVS is also a partner who can help uh, with establishing such Yes, partners. exactly. So in order to carry that out, you'll need a partner with an extensive network or know, who knows how to carry out uh, a successful outreach to leading um, uh, targets for potential partnerships in China on your behalf. Yes. Yes, it's a complicated process to bring all the parties together, even in, in a pilot and especially in an industry such as uh, energy because of the nature of the, the players in the industry being uh, majority, if not all of them, uh, SOEs. Um, so bringing those together in, in the pilot is, is a complicated process and making sure that you protect as a foreign uh, company, which, which are the ones that we invest in and expand here in China, you protect your IP along that process is, is vital, even during the uh, pilot, pilot phase before establishing a you know more firm foothold in the Chinese market so this is what we we bring got it uh, thanks Nick uh, thanks Yazat uh, let's go to the next question and the next question is uh, regarding the manufacturing whether it's necessary to, to set up a manufacturing base in China in order to work with the on the large projects in China um, I mean, it depends. Um, we, we do see sometimes it can be beneficial to, uh, again, it, it depends on the IP, depends on the company, but whether you choose simply direct production, sometimes it can be beneficial or from a support point of view, especially in energy to consider an R&D center. Um, like Yazad has gone through and, and highlighted a couple of times, it also depends on, on where in China that you're locating because of the different uh, policy measures that each province brings to the table and each city within the province brings to the table. So the, all of these needs to be uh, assessed uh, in, in, in a study, uh, feasibility study, uh, pilot, so on and so forth. So, so whether you start with a assembly production, um, a partnership on, on bringing your product to, to the market in China is, is really dependent on, on the individual company and not just, you know, yes, you have, this is the playbook for everybody and this is how you do it one, two, three, that doesn't really exist. Okay, thank you, Nick. And I think we have uh, time for one last short question. If anybody has it, please uh, type it in. Okay. Okay, if no more questions coming in, I uh, will launch the poll to, and we'll kindly ask you to indicate your interest whether you'd like to follow up with LVS and your feedback on the webinar. So Chris, uh, let's launch the poll. Mm -hmm. And we will wait for, for a minute for all answers to come in. Ten more seconds. Okay. 
Thank you everyone for participating and a special thanks to Yazad and Nick uh, who, who were representing LVS today and shared with us all these wonderful insights. Uh, we hope that uh, this information and knowledge shared in this webinar would be very useful and we'll follow up with all connections uh, after we close this session. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, stay safe and healthy and see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining. Thank you.